Amen. Good morning, church. <clears throat> I apologize. I got a bit of a throat thing happening this morning. How was your week this week? Great, great week. That's great. Really good week in here a little bit. That's great. Talk to these people after. I'm Trev. I'm the spiritual formation pastor here at Carper Hills Church. If you're a guest today, happy to be teaching the message this morning. Uh, finally off preaching probation from the Bangkok bar fight sermon. Excuse <laughs> me. Uh, I should probably play it safe today. We'll see how that goes. I should mention also that uh, in case you're thinking Copper Hills is getting uh, extra manly, I should remind you that many of our women are at the women's retreat uh, this morning, uh, and my wife Amy is a speaker. In fact, she's probably speaking right now, which is a first. She and I are speaking at the same time in different venues. That's kind of cool. Um, and here's another first. I... I'm on the verge of becoming an American taxpayer. I know. That's exciting, right? Bring Canadian pastors into America so they can pay taxes. It's genius. And that's why last weekend, um, I had to take my family to the Canadian consulate in Los Angeles to get some paperwork done so that we could become legit taxpayers. So, California. <laughs> it's different from here. <laughs> Arizona pickup trucks, tailgates, and ribeye steaks. California electric cars, beaches, and lots of vegan options at the restaurants. Did you notice that? Um, in case you're judging California right now, just wait. The, uh, and gas is like a dollar more per gallon. Did you notice this? Is it bad to like fill up on the Arizona side, drive around California, and then coast back into the Chevron? <laughs> on the Arizona, kids, get out and push! We gotta make it to the Chevron! It's crazy. Uh, very good weekend. I wanna, I wanna tell you guys about it in the context of um, the scriptures. Most of what I'm gonna illustrate the scriptures from uh, are from my daily life, like are from this week. Do you guys find that this is a little bit the coaching session and that the game is played out there? When you go through those doors, let me tell you what happened. So where are we right now? We're in Jesus' famous speech, uh, speech from the hillside, or as it's called more often, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus describes the kind of people we are becoming as the reign of God increasingly takes hold in our lives and we increasingly live in his kingdom in the presence of the king and his people so that we increasingly become like him, more and more bearing the resemblance of the royal family. Up to this point in his speech, in this series, Jesus has invited us to nip anger in the bud before it gets a hold of us by going upstream into our hearts and dealing with it while it's still in seed form. Those little seeds demanding to have, when we want to have our way and have our will and have our wants and have everything. That's the point to deal with it. To avoid cultivating lust of any kind by similarly going upstream to our thoughts and desires and making the change there. Uh, to lay aside manipulating people with our words to get what we want. To lay aside the desire for payback or getting even that keeps the cycle of revenge escalating. To stop trying to secure ourselves with wealth or even trying to look good, like with reputation, that drives so much anxiety in our lives. Jesus is the only one who truly understands how the world really works. And he's trying to let us in on it here. He's trying to give us his worldview. Now, do you know what a worldview is? That you have a way of seeing the world. Okay? You have a worldview. We get our worldview, all of us have it, we get our worldview from a whole bunch of sources. First of all, our parents are a huge influence on that when we're growing up. That may be the biggest influence. Um, our teachers have an influence on us, positive or negative. At some point, usually in our teen years, our friends become more influential. Uh, we think our parents and teachers don't get it and that our friends are really the ones who know what's going on. Wasn't it Mark Twain who said, uh, when I was 14, I thought my old man was so ignorant. And then uh, when I turned 21, I realized how much he got right. And I was so amazed at how much the old man learned in seven years. <laughs> I think, it was, I think it was Mark Twain who said that. I, didn't, I don't have the exact quote, but. Um, 
Another big influence on our worldview is the culture in which we grew up on, in has all sorts of assumptions embedded in it. And we don't question them because we, we can't see them. They're just assumed, right? We can't, we can't see them in the way that a fish can't see water, right? It just, it's there. It just, it's not, no one, fishes don't think about water. It's, it's a baseline assumption of their existence. We've got these little cultural assumptions uh, in, in our life as well. If you were born... Um, after 1965, uh, television was probably incredibly influential in your worldview. You start to get this window in on different parts of the world. Uh, if you were born after 1995, the internet has really affected your worldview. And I'm including your things that ride on the internet, like social media or online dating or digital disruptions of our world, like Uber and other stuff. And I purposely put the internet at the end here uh, of things that affect our worldview because I want you to consider this morning... Uh, that not everything in your worldview is true. What do you think about that? Like, not everything you saw on the internet is true. Do you realize this? As the uh, great theologian Marvin Gaye said in his treatise, I heard it through the grapevine, <laughs> believe half of what you see and none of what you hear. Not everything you saw on TV is real. I think not even reality TV is real, <laughs> despite the name. If you're a teenager, I'm here today to tell you not everything you f your friends tell you is true. Can you believe that? But also, not everything our parents passed on to us is true either. What do you think about that? And finally, if you're older and wiser and have experienced some things in life, uh, what if I told you some of your own conclusions about life are perhaps not true or not as true as you thought? Do you agree with that? Hmm. Ever have some suspicions about your own thinking and whether you got that right or not, whether you've come to the right conclusion? Ever come to the wrong conclusion about something or someone? Interpreted something wrongly? I sure have. I remember when we crashed that church plant, you know, six years of our lives, I thought... It's all my fault. It must be I'm not good enough. I'm not good. I, th I don't think God's with me, with us. I came to some conclusions. Probably some wrong conclusions. You ever, you know, it's tough. You get that. It's hard to get rid of that now. That you've come to that conclusion. Have you ever had that? Okay. Think about that. And with that, we come to Jesus' critical teaching on judging. Okay, I find this a bit funny. My pieces in this series so far that they gave me on the Sermon on the Mount are anger, revenge, and judging. <laughs> Which, as you can see, we have time perfectly for the run-up to the U.S. elections. Um, I think it's like Pastor Hazing. Let's give Trevor anger, revenge, and judging before the election. <laughs> okay, let's talk about judging. We've got to get to the scriptures really quick. We're not even going to go line by line because there's so much in here. We're going to do a half line at a time for some of this, Okay. Some of the best moral teaching on the planet of all time. Okay, let's start with this idea of judging in Matthew 7.1. Here's what it says. Do not judge others and you will not be judged. I'm reading from the NLT. You're going to have a little bit of variations on this in your Bible. Uh, let's just deal with the first four words here. Do not judge others. Wow, okay. What does it mean to judge others? The word that we have here that the Bible is using is uh, crino. Uh, it's used for technical legal decisions, but also more generally for forming judgments and reaching conclusions about both things and people. So, is Jesus saying that we are not to come to any kind of conclusions about situations or people? No, that's not it. Uh, you have to assess and come to some conclusions about things and people in order to function in life, right? For example, you want your kids to have good judgment, right? Having poor judgment can be a big problem, making the wrong decision or trusting the wrong person. Uh, to have good judgment is to understand how the world really works and what, uh, ex and this is exactly what Jesus is trying to teach us, okay? How the world really works. So, what kind of judging is Jesus saying to avoid? He's talking about coming to this negative conclusion about something or someone as if we know the whole story of what's going on there, right? To sit in judgment. 
of someone. Have you discovered yet that we really know what's going on, really going on with people in their life and in their world? What Jesus is talking about here is the don't you judge me kind of judging. It has an air of superiority, pride, and self-righteousness in it. I'm right, you're wrong, I know, you don't. This is what he's cautioning about. And people can feel that judgment, even if it's unspoken. If you're still not sure about the difference, at your next performance review, at work, when your supervisor evaluates you, look at him or her square in the eye and say, don't you judge me. <laughs> then you will have time to reflect on the difference while you're looking for a new job. <laughs> okay, the second half of that verse, 7-1-B, okay? And you will not be judged, or if you're reading the NIV this morning, or you too will be judged. Okay, so have you ever been judged? Have you ever been judged? I bet you have. Maybe you didn't know it. Maybe you did, because as we said, you can often feel it. Have you ever feel, felt people judging you on, like whatever, your background, your level of success, how you dress, the car you drive, your level of education, how smart you are, how capable you are or not, uh, how beautiful you are? I get judged on that a lot. Um, can you go back to a moment in your life when someone was measuring you and you felt like you didn't measure up? Okay, how did that make you feel? Okay, so that's the reason not to do it. Right there, look at verse two. Uh, For you will be treated as you treat others. Jesus is now, this is so interesting to me. This is, Jesus is now teaching us how things work. This is a very interesting bit of spiritual dynamics. Do you see the implications here? We actually have some, some power to influence how we are treated by others. Not total control, but we're part of the system. And, and moreover, do you see the foreshadowing here? Do you see where this is headed? This, this idea of uh, you, you'll, you'll be treated as you treat others? Coming up very soon. In verse 12 is the golden rule. Do for others what you want them to do for you. What you're putting out there comes back. Do you see the Aikido with this? That's another sermon. I'm not going to go there again. Well, a little bit. Uh, Jesus doesn't come straight at it. There's, uh, the reason I call it an Aikido is there's a bit of a redirect there. Do you notice that? He doesn't just say, be good to people. Thus saith the Lord. Do you notice it doesn't say that? Uh, it, it says, do the thing that you want to come back at you. Okay, now I have to think carefully if this is coming back, what I'm going to do and what I'm going to say. It's the same sowing and reaping effect that we see in judging and the golden rules. This is connecting the judging thing to like the heart of, you remember he summarized the whole law and the prophets to like in the golden rule. Um, and then Jesus gives us even more detail on how this works. He says this, the standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Oh, interesting. So, what are your measuring sticks? What are my measuring sticks? How do you tend to judge people? What things can make you come to a pre-mature conclusion about someone? Race, culture, politics? How smart they seem, how hardworking they are, how they look, their accent, <laughs> out and about, sorry. <laughs> now, let's say this. Say you're extremely hardworking, okay? You might say, I'm fine judging people on how hard they work because I, I win on that measure. I've developed this ability to be very hardworking. Like I'm, I think we should judge people on that, right? You can often tell by the head movement that you're judging. Right? Okay. Does anyone doubt that that's probably coming around to bite you in the hind quarters later? Like maybe you, um, for example, uh, say you age. You, you will. Uh, or you get injured and you can't work as hard and suddenly you can't measure up to your own standards. Ever felt that? My standard's this and I'm not even meeting my own standard. Why am I, now why am I into this over here? I'm not even meeting my own standard. Where's that lead you? Shame. Self-condemnation, it's going all the wrong way. To cement this concept in our mind, Jesus goes on to present this ridiculous visual in verse 3. 
Do you remember this? Verse 3 is what he says. And why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you rid, uh, help, help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Wow. Convicting. Okay. So how does Jesus know that this judgmental, opinionated person in the visual has a two by four in their eyeball and can't see clearly? Are we to presume that in this story it's one of those religious Pharisees that is so unlike us? <laughs> does Jesus know that this person has secret sins? Or is it just because everybody has sin and shouldn't be poking around other people's delicate parts of their life? No. I propose to you that the reason Jesus knows this, this person has got this log, this sin that caused him to can't, can't see, is because the judging itself is the sin. It's the judging itself that causes us to not really be able to see what's going on in someone's world. And certainly on a level to trust us to deal with these delicate parts. The idea that we think in our pride that we really know what's going on and we see things as they truly are and we self-righteously presume to correct people. Okay? Then that word hypocrite again in there with an exclamation, right? Hypocrite. First get rid of the log in your own eye. Do you guys remember this word from the Greek? Hypocrite, what it means, it's the, it's the actor in a Greek play who has a mask. That they would actually act with the, the mask on the stick. Remember, you've seen, you've seen the comedy and tragedy masks at a, at a movie or something? Those are, those are hypocrite masks. One's a happy and one's a sad because the hypocrite would put the mask on and that would be part of the acting it's because they would be dealing this way and then they would deal with the crowd like you'd see that they're two-faced. They're actually a different kind of person. Um... Deep down, they're really something else. Jesus hates this. You can tell. Who, who knows someone who um, stays far from God or doesn't come to church because of uh, hypocrisy in the church? Yeah. This is a problem. That, that like it's an evangelism, it's a discipleship problem, but it's like an evangelism problem. Like sometimes, you know, uh, what you, you, you've heard said, um, actually everybody speaks highly of Jesus. It's his bride that they don't like. I can say that because all the brides are on the women's retreat right now, but <laughs> take that out of the video. Megan, could you please, on the internet? This, it's, it's beyond just a moral issue. This is, this is like a discipleship and an evangelism issue. So let's get real. Ever notice how Jesus is always moving in the scriptures towards the lepers, the prostitutes, the pagans, and the tax collectors? Like he's moving towards them? Like I don't think he's endorsing the prostitution lifestyle, but he's like move, moving towards that. And anytime he gets super mad, it's at religious people and religious leaders. Anyone other than me a bit nervous about that? <laughs> I mean, I'm a religious leader and we are the religious people in this culture. So like, let's let that sink in for a sec. Okay. Moving along swiftly. Finally, we have this final verse. Don't waste what is holy on people who are unholy. Or your NIV might say, dogs in there. It's just a little bit translation. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls, then turn and attack you. Okay. After all we've seen in these verses, do you think Jesus is calling broken people unholy pigs? <laughs> and that they are not worthy of the pearls of our perfectly correct worldview that we can distribute to them. I propose that the point is actually the opposite. We, use, we actually use that verse in the Bible in society to the opposite of what it means. Yeah, I've heard it in a business situation before. Wow, don't cast your pearls before swine. Meaning they don't, like, they don't get it. Well, I get it, but they don't get it. Right? The, the pride of that. It, I think it, it actually means the opposite is what I think Jesus is getting at here. Uh, the problem is not with the swine, it's with the pearls. Our pearls are no good to them. Can't nurse them, doesn't feed them. It's not, it's the wrong thing for this situation. It doesn't help them. So we should think twice before we force our pearls of wisdom on other people. Okay, let me anchor this then in real life. Can I, can, can I just grab my water right there? And, uh, or the one that's on the floor, yeah. 
I don't want to drink out of someone else's or that whole row is going to have like a nasal congestion this week. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Um, okay, so went to Los Angeles last weekend. Had to go for the taxes and uh, might as well make a weekend of it. Um, we didn't go anywhere with the kids for spring break. Uh, so Brad graciously said, hey, take the weekend off. Um, you got to go to LA anyway for the tax thing. Take the girls. Uh, enjoy it. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, Amy, my wife Amy, is really good with the internet and the travel arrangement type stuff. And she got on the internet and got this unbelievable hotel for an unbelievable price. Almost like it was a mistake and they forgot to take it off the Travelocity or the Friends and Family or whatever, like the whole, right? So we're excited. You ready? So she gets us hooked up at the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Beverly Hills for low price. Not even joking. So we drive like six hours with our Dutch Brother Coffee's road trip. And, um, and we pull up. And there's this moment when you know you might be at risk of being in a judgy kind of situation. <laughs> like you pull into the parking area and it's all um, Tesla Roadsters and uh, Mercedes SUVs and Bentleys, okay? We roll up in this big white Toyota Sequoia with yellow bug guts all on the front <laughs> and like the car top carrier and a tent trailer, honk honk! Um, not really a tent trailer, but it felt like that. And, I, and in that moment, I, I just realized, oh, we have become the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> like actually, in Beverly Hills. Like, it used to be a comedy on TV, and now it's my real life. What choices have I made in my life that have brought me to this moment? Anyway, this is a really famous hotel. It's like the original Hollywood hotel. What I didn't know is that there would be a Hollywood red carpet event like every night there. Okay, so we eventually got used to it. But on the first night, we're going we're gonna to go uh, walk to dinner because you can like walk to stuff. So we were actually going to walk to dinner on Ro um, Rodeo Drive. By the way, that's Rodeo Drive, not Rodeo Drive. <laughs> it's, rodeo Drive is a whole different situation. Um, and also, I'll just give this little California pointer, uh, Beverly Hills pointer. If you're taking a bunch of women for whom you're financially responsible to Rodeo Drive, uh, go at around 6.30 p.m. Um, you can see everything, but all the stores are closed. <laughs> it's great. Um, and thank goodness, because Sophie was actually looking for a uh, prom dress at this. So you don't want to get one of those on Rodeo Drive, right? <laughs> But we, she was really looking for one. It's coming down to the wire here. We're under pressure. So anyway, we're going to walk to dinner. We come down to the lobby. We come down to the lobby. Um, and there's red carpets are out. Paparazzi, crowds, security guys. Um, these red velvet ropes to keep the crowd back from the stars. Uh, one of the guys from the band Imagine Dragons, uh, you know, brushes by me to the washroom. And um, like, what's going on? I asked someone... And it's crowded. I'm like, I'm like, what is this? And they tell me. This guy tells me, oh, this is a big Hollywood event celebrating transgender people. <laughs> At that moment, my phone rings. It's Tim Brown, one of our church elders who also leads our life groups uh, ministry. I answer the phone disoriented. And uh, he says, I, it, but it's really loud. Like it's a crowd. It's really loud. And Tim says, where are you? I'm like, I, so, I, so I say, I don't know, but I might need you to come pick me up. <laughs> Bring the truck. I'm, I'm out of place. Like I'm feeling out of place, right? I'm a chubby middle-aged suburban dad with zip-off khaki cargo pants. Nike shocks, Eddie Bauer soft shell, and Arizona Cardinals ball cap at a Hollywood transgender red carpet event. I mean, one of these things is not like the others. So, full disclosure, 
I don't really have a good line on the trans community, okay? Um, I have gay friends. I, I don't have trans friends that I know of. Um, I don't naturally encounter that in my world. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an American evangelical pastor who works at a church one mile from my house. <laughs> okay? Maybe, like, a little bit, like, here at the church office, sometimes butch's footwear can be a bit feminine. But <laughs> that's it. That's as far as it goes. Like, that's as far as we're going to get. I'm, of course, talking about the rainbow flip-flops from San Clemente. <laughs> which I did buy. They're super comfortable. I bought some, actually. You were right. You were right about those. They're awesome. Okay, here's what I'm getting at. Here's what I'm getting at, okay? So I don't have a line on that trans community. If you don't have friends in the other tribe that you're faced with, it's a lot easier to judge, okay? So I'm in this situation, I'm uncomfortable um, and at risk of seriously judging. I don't know what to do from here. Like, I don't know, I navigate it. And that's when my 17-year-old says looks through at one of the stars and says, hey, I know her. And heads off in the crowd. He says, hey, I know her. She's a famous trans YouTuber. I've heard of her. And heads off into the crowd. Gets up to the front at the little velvet row. And guess what happens? I'm going to tell you but first, let's consider a few helpful spiritual practices that will help us position our hearts and minds to be naturally less judgmental in this situation, okay? This is application. So, as you're coming in a situation, this is six pointers. Number one, remember nothing is as it seems. This is one of the big themes of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. There's something else going on that you can't see, almost always. Spiritual stuff is largely unseen. The kingdom is like a treasure hidden in a field. There's a hiddenness. To the kingdom, right? We see the outer, but everything's being driven by the inner uh, that we can't see. So when you see something ludicrous or someone says something crazy, um, instead of going on uh, full attack, frontal assault, get shrewd and say to yourself, I wonder what's driving that. So my kid, I keep, think different, okay? Number two, assume everyone you meet in life is secretly in the fight of their life. Because they probably are. Maybe it's their finances, their marriage, their job, a relationship, their health, their mental health, their kids, their family, their sexuality. I don't know. But it's likely hidden because we mostly want people to think that we're okay. Don't we? And for some reason, we especially want people at church to think we're okay. I love the uh, no perfect people sign out front, which is a huge statement. I love it. I'm not sure it actually works. Have you ever been yelling at your kids in the car when you're arriving at church late? And then you can be yelling at the car and then you step out of the car and go and turn it on. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Flip the switch. Remember that book, I'm Okay, You're Okay? I think we should have a book. You're not okay, I'm not okay, but we want to be friends. Um, number three, here's a good one. Make friends outside your tribe. Humans are tribal. Birds of a feather do flock together. I'm telling you, it's the path of least resistance. The problem with that is this. When we're in a group of people who have all the same views as us, it magnifies the self-righteousness. Have you noticed that? A good place to observe this is in kids' sports. I was at the soccer game last weekend, and because my daughter is the goalkeeper, watching her often means I'm down at the end with the opposing team who wants to see their kids score. The opposing parents. Okay? Sometimes I introduce myself and explain that I'm the dad of the goalie, and that's why I'm down at their end. And I have found that just my presence alone from the other tribe can change how people talk. They'll be polite. They'll even compliment. They'll say, wow, she's really good. She made a great save. <laughs> um, this was a very clean game that we were watching, I thought. But one of the sets of the opposing parents was just getting increasingly enraged. It's funny how you see things differently, like what your girls do to their girls and our girls do to those ones. 
the slightest jostle of their little girl. Those effing bees! Oh my God, this is outrageous! <laughs> Venom, epithets, hatred. It was like jarring. Um, uh, they're little girls. Like, so I'm standing there. And this is all happening here. It's starting to, it's agitating me. I'm standing there and uh, one of the soccer moms of our team had found one of my sermons online on YouTube. And um, maybe even the Bar Bangkok bar fight sermon. <laughs> and what came up to me and started talking to me excitedly about my sermon. And uh, this guy <laughs> turns and shouts at us, could you be quiet, quiet please? Now, being a super spiritual pastor of spiritual formation, <laughs> what do you think I did? I simply shot back, sir, why don't you be quiet? <laughs> Zero Aikido. Again. How helpful do you think that was? Zero helpful. Don't judge me. You can't judge me in the sermon when I'm talking about. <laughs> you have to wait for the car ride home to judge me on this sermon. Just made him even more mad, so now I just have to move away to diffuse. Okay, that's not great by me, but mostly we want to move towards what appears to be our natural enemy if we can. Jesus is always moving towards. It's a spiritual discipline because it's difficult. Just walk across the room. And here's the secret. If you only get one thing out of this message, this is the thing I, should, I think you should get. Are you ready? If you only get one thing, here it is. You can be friends with people without endorsing their entire worldview. Boom. Can I say that again? You can be friends with people without endorsing their entire worldview. You can... Oh, yeah. Nice. Look at that. You can love people and authentically look out for their best interests without having to reconcile everything you disagree on. Now, what if they ask you to endorse stuff? Wait for number six. <laughs> number four, I got to hurry this up. Choose face-to-face -face over technology. So social media is not helping with the judging. I don't know. You know, you look at your, you can self-judge, you look at your friends, the best 1% of their life and start to feel like you don't measure up. But also, uh, on the other hand, social media seems to make people overconfident in their opinion because they can launch the nukes from the comfort and safety of their living room easy chair. Uh, it's so funny, I have friends who have little or no personal financial management skills who have actually had to go and personally rescue financially, get on social media and shout economic advice at the government <laughs> or the opposing political party. Like they know, it's, it's so funny. Um, I don't know why we do this. Do we actually think that ever brings anyone over to our side? I don't know. Has it persuaded you? Someone shouting on Facebook about their view or doing something? Anyway, they just unfriend you. Uh, or you unfriend them. Don't worry. It's all fine. Everybody's unfriends. Uh, I don't know. Facebook and elections don't seem to go very well together. So um, what do you do? Number five, ask a question and listen. If this person you're encountering now face-to-face -face, instead of on social media says something about themselves, just say this, wow, what's that like? Let them describe their, like, an easy question. Say, wow, what's that, what's that like? I met someone at the pool. I met a movie star at the pool at the Beverly Hills. And he had some kids, and I couldn't place where he was. And, you know, I didn't, I, I just said, wow, what's that like raising kids in Beverly Hills? That's, like, good for an hour, that question. <laughs> right? Ask a question. Well, what that's like, and just listen. Remember, listening is a form of human love. Setting aside our own agenda in favor of someone else. This has huge implications in all kinds of relationships. Guys, if you go on a date, ask her a question and listen. And then, ask her another question. <laughs> See how that works? Girls, if you go on a date, ask him a question about himself, and then let him talk about himself. <laughs> then ask another question. I think they should change my, past, my title from pastor of spiritual formation to pastor of love. <laughs> Put that on the list. We'll talk about that. Number six. I got to hurry up here. Diffuse judgment landmines. Ever notice how Jesus appends this little phrase onto lots of his teaching? For those who have ears to hear. 
And then he says something. Why does he do that? Because even if it's Jesus speaking deadly accurate capital T truth, sometimes people are just not in a position or a place to hear that. Like they're not open to it. So I've noticed there are landmines here in America that will shut down a conversation instantly, close minds and cause people to stop listening and retreat into their tribal strong stronghold. We don't need to list them here because you know them better than me. Um, I, I will tell you this, so I got some specific ones. Like I, uh, you know, if I'm sitting on a plane um, and someone asks me, oh, what do you do? I don't open with, I'm an American evangelical pastor. <laughs> That's like a conversation ender. <laughs> Right there, I'll usually say something like, I work in communications, or I'm a professional storyteller. <laughs> if I want to elicit some curiosity. Um, but what if someone corners you and wants you to endorse something you can't endorse? Right? I will avoid endorsing and try, but try and keep the relationship intact. For example, our new fridge died, and the warranty guy was going to come and fix it. So I get him on the phone to arrange a service call, and he launched into this huge political rant they hit all the landmines and a few thermonuclear devices as well. And then he said those three magic words. Don't you agree? But I did not agree with all of his views. So I said, actually, I've just arrived from Canada and U.S. immigration made me sign an affidavit saying I would not comment on U.S. politics for two years after moving here. <laughs> okay. I did say this. He said, really? I said, no, but I really just need my fridge fixed, man. He laughed and got her done. See that? Okay, let's, let's end where we began. In Beverly Hills. Big transgender red carpet event. Sophie heads off into the crowd. Amy and Allie follow her. I'm left standing there with zip-off cargo pants. But I can, I can see what's happening. Uh, I can't hear, but I can see. Sophie gets up to the rope, and all these people want to talk to this famous transgender person. But somehow she engages with Sophie. Sophie said something. I can't really see what it is. I can't hear what they're talking about, but they're connecting. And in fact, they're connecting so much that this woman decides to go around the crowd barrier into the, into the crowd and start engaging with Sophie and Ali and, and Amy there. And I guess somehow it came up that Sophie needed a dress for prom. So she, so she gave her her dress for prom. Now, this, this didn't work out in the end because I would not send my daughter to prom in that dress. <laughs> but still, what a kind, selfless gesture from someone outside my tribe that I would be in a position to judge. And that's when I realized, oh, this is the parable of the Good Samaritan in real life, in my life. Why did Jesus make the hero of that story a Samaritan? Samaritans were racially and religiously marginalized group, disliked by God's people to the extent that God's people would not even talk to them. Why make the Samaritan the hero? Oh, because the judgmental people listening to that parable would judge that and then Jesus would turn the tables and reveal their biases. But now here I was judging and the transgender person is cast as the hero and doing a lot more for my family than I'm doing for her. And the tables are turned on me. Do not judge others and you will not be judged for you will be treated as you treat others. Like usual, I got tested on my teaching as I'm preparing it. It's, it's out there. How did I do? Not great. But like always... On Jesus' test, there's endless second chances and do-overs. Your test is coming. I promise you. I promise you. At an unexpected moment, probably the next few weeks, starting from when you leave the church parking lot. Maybe before. So let's help each other. Let's discuss this in our life groups. Let's work this out in real life and with our friends. And tell us your stories. We want to know how this goes and the not judging thing. Let's practice being the church that holds fast to our beliefs while steadfastly refusing to be judgmental. Let's pray. Lord Jesus. Wow, wow, wow. What a week. We humble ourselves before you. We say, teach us, Lord. We want to be your people. We want to be people of the kingdom who hold fast to those values 
to hold fast to the values of the kingdom. Lord. But also, we don't want to be a judgmental people. We don't want to keep people out of church and away from you because of our own hypocrisy. Help us not to wear masks, but to be real, to be open about our failings, Lord, and to just trust you. Change our worldview, Jesus. Change it to look like yours. Change how we think and view the world so we can view it like you. We trust you with our lives. Show us the way. In your holy name we pray. Amen.